You've probably heard of the Black-Scholes model, but do you know exactly how it works or why it's so powerful? In just a few short minutes, you'll learn the components of the model, its assumptions, and how it prices options. All explained without the need for any complex math. By the end, you'll have a tool that can sharpen your understanding of options and take your trading decisions to the next level. Let's start by asking, why do we even need a model in the first place? Think of a model like a map. It's not a perfect replica of the world, but a simplified version that focuses on what's important and leaves out the rest. After all, a perfect map, as big as the world itself, wouldn't help anyone. Just like how a simple 2D map was enough for sailors to navigate treacherous oceans, an option pricing model helps us chart our way through the turbulent waters of the option market. When it comes to options, things can get pretty complicated. Prices change quickly, and a single stock can have hundreds of options tied to it each with its own unique variables. Multiply this out by the thousands of optionable stocks and comparison between them seems impossible. That's where a model becomes a game changer. It simplifies all this complexity by expressing those fast moving prices in terms of slower changing factors like implied volatility and the Greeks, which allow for easy comparison between all the different contracts. Think of it like this. Comparing raw option prices across different stocks would be chaotic and meaningless because the prices are influenced by so many different factors. Stock price, time to expiration, volatility, and more. Each of these factors can vary widely between stocks, but when you compare their implied volatilities, you're speaking a common language that cuts through the noise and lets you focus on what really matters. In this example, which option is more expensive? You may be tempted to say that option on stock A, but if we convert them to implied volatility, we can see that option on stock B in volatility terms is more expensive. That is why professional options traders will refer to option prices in terms of implied volatility. Black and Scholes came up with their model to answer a big question. If stock prices move randomly in a log normal way, but consistent with constant interest rates and volatility, what should an options price be at any moment in time for a perfectly hedged position to just break even? A hedged position means holding a specific amount of shares at any given moment in time to ensure the overall position neither makes nor loses money. Essentially, it's about adjusting the number of shares to offset the changes in the price of the option, making sure that the value of the position remains neutral. Consequently, this number is actually represented by the Greek delta, which indicates how many shares are needed to hedge the position. The answer to their question led to the equation you're seeing now. It might look a little intimidating, but don't worry, this is just math's way of showing how changes in two key variables, stock price S and time T, affect the value of something else, the call option C. If you look closer, you'll recognize some familiar terms. Delta, how the call price changes with a change in stock price S. Gamma, the rate of change of delta, or how delta changes as the stock price changes. And theta, how the call price changes as time passes. You'll also notice discounting terms like RS, which represent the forward price of the stock. This is the stock's value at expiration if only interest affects its price. Negative RC discounts the call options value back to present terms, meaning it removes the effects of interest from the option's future value at expiration. Then there's volatility represented by the Greek letter sigma, is the standard deviation of the assumed log normal distribution, showing how the stock price's movements affect the rate of delta changes. Volatility reflects the uncertainty or variability in the stock's price, and the higher it is, the greater the potential for options price changes. This means there is a higher chance of finishing in the money and thus higher volatility will increase options prices. We can see here that the same option with a strike of 100 and a current stock price of 75 will be priced higher when its volatility is higher, since it has a greater chance of finishing above 100. This is represented by a larger area under the curve. One key assumption in the Black-Scholes model is that volatility stays constant throughout the option's life. That's not realistic, of course, but it makes the math simpler while still giving us a very useful framework. To actually calculate these effects, like the Greeks and the call price, the equation needs to be solved. Fortunately, that's already been done for us, and the solution is what we now know as the famous Black-Scholes model. Looking at the Black-Scholes model, it might still seem a bit intimidating, but let's break it down step by step. What do these two main terms actually mean? The term SND1 answers, if I held this option until expiration, what would be the average value of all the stock prices above the strike price? In other words, it's the amount you will earn for owning this option on average. The term e to the power of negative RTND2 answers, what's the likelihood that the option holder will end up paying the exercise price at expiration? Multiplying this by strike x, we can calculate how much it will cost on average to own this option. Put together, these terms represent the current expected value of the option. By subtracting the average we will pay for this option from the average we will earn from this option, we can get its fair value. To explain this concept further, we will imagine a discrete log normal distribution of stock prices at expiration, where each possible price is in 50 cent intervals. A log normal distribution is just one where taking the log of the values gives you a normal distribution. It works for stock prices because stocks can't drop below zero and tend to follow this pattern historically. Now, let's evaluate a call option with a strike price of 10.50. First, 
we calculate the value of all stock above 1050. This means we're adding up the values for all stock prices in the range where the option is in the money. This includes $11 and higher multiplied by their frequency. For example, $11 appears eight times, and so the value of the $11 trough is $88. We do the same with 12, multiplying by seven, and so on until 20. Then, we find the average value of all stock above the strike by dividing this number by the total number of all occurrences in the distribution. Next, we determine the likelihood of paying the strike price. We get the likelihood by dividing the number of occurrences above the strike price by the total number of occurrences in the distribution. The expected cost from exercising this option is this likelihood multiplied by the strike price. As we can see, the average value of all stock above the strike price, or more simply, the average amount we'll earn for holding this option to expiration, is $3.30. We can also see that the strike price multiplied by the likelihood of finishing in the money, or more simply, the average amount we expect to pay if we hold the option to expiration, is $2.52. From this, we can conclude that the current fair value of the option is the difference between these two values, or 78 cents. Before continuing, let's define two important probability functions, lowercase n of x and uppercase n of x. Lowercase n of x is the standard normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. The total area under the curve equals one, representing 100% of all possible occurrences. Uppercase n of x is the cumulative normal distribution function. It calculates the probability of occurrences less than a given x value by measuring the area under the curve from negative infinity to x. For example, n of positive infinity is equal to 1 because it includes all possible occurrences. n of 0 is equal to 0 0.5 since the curve is symmetrical with 50% of occurrences on either side of the mean. The Black-Scholes model uses probabilities from a normal distribution, even though we've assumed that stock prices follow a log normal distribution. That might sound like a mismatch, but with a simple adjustment to the variable x, we can still use n of x to calculate probabilities for a log normal distribution. Now, let's break down some important terms you've likely seen before. The mode is the highest point of the distribution where most occurrences happen. The mean is the balance point where the total value is evenly split on both sides. And the median is the middle value where half the occurrences fall to the left and half to the right. In a perfect normal distribution, these three points align. But in a log normal distribution, they're spread out. Understanding these points help us adjust from a log normal to a normal framework. In Black-Scholes, the relationship between the strike price and stock price is key. For a normal distribution, this is straightforward. It's just the stock price S minus the strike price X. But in a log normal distribution, we have to adjust by taking the logarithm, giving us the natural logarithm of S over X. If S is greater than X, this value is positive and the call is in the money. If S is less than X, the value is negative and the call is out of the money. Now, let's adjust for two key components that affect option pricing, interest rates and volatility. First, since options are valued based on the forward price and the forward price depends on interest rates, we need to account for interest rates over the life of the option. This adjustment ensures that pricing reflects the present value of the stock's expected price at expiration. Next, let's consider volatility. In a log normal distribution, stock prices are skewed with a longer right tail. This results in the mean of the distribution being shifted slightly to the right of the mode. The shift is mathematically equivalent to sigma squared times t divided by 2, where sigma is the volatility and t is time. Combining these adjustments, interest rates and volatility, gives us the numerator for d1 in the Black-Scholes model. To wrap things up, we need to convert this value into a number of standard deviations, because standard deviations help measure how far the strike price is from the mean in a log normal distribution. Here's how it works. Over any time period t, one standard deviation is equal to sigma times root t. The square root of time comes into play because volatility increases with time, but not in a straight line. Price changes spread out more slowly as time passes. By dividing the difference between the stock price and the exercise price by this value, we get D1. Essentially, D1 tells us how many standard deviations the strike price is from the mean. The equation, again, might look complicated, but it's really just a way to adjust the stock and strike prices so that we can use a cumulative normal distribution to calculate probabilities. Finally, combining this with the forward price of the stock gives us the expected average profit of the option at expiration. To figure out the likelihood that an option will be exercised, we use the median of the log normal distribution. This is the point that splits the total occurrences in half, and it usually falls to the left of the mean. The value nd2 uses this median to estimate the probability of the option being in the money at expiration. Multiplying this probability by the exercise price gives us the average amount we'll pay if we own the option. Combining this with the first term will give us the expected value of the call option at expiration. But because we're paying for the option today, we have to adjust for the present value. Multiplying both terms by e to the power of negative rt gives us the familiar Black-Scholes model. This adjustment ensures that the model reflects the fair price of of the option in today's terms. 